from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. It is a pleasure to welcome you to a two-week series titled Religion, A Search for the Meaning to Life. Uh, three or four years ago, we did a series of programs on religion, and uh, it's a very important topic and also one that we enjoy very, very much discussing. And we're very fortunate today and next week to have two guests highly qualified to discuss this topic. I welcome to the program, first of all, Father Bob Hazries. He is the pastor of St. Luke's Episcopal Church here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. He's also involved in many um, community activities in relation to his work uh, for our community. Uh, Father Hazrez, welcome to the program. We're very pleased to have you here. Thank you. I've had a number of discussions with you over the years, and, and you certainly spark uh, great uh, thinking uh, in us when we discuss those subjects, and we know that will happen to our audience. Our second guest today we're equally happy to have with us is Reverend Flora Bowers. She is the district superintendent of the Eastern Washington and North Idaho United Methodist Church. And Reverend Bowers, I've uh, been attending some meetings that you we're in charge uh, of presiding over, and again, we're just delighted that you too have that great gift to uh, have us to uh, search for uh, these questions and uh, their answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. And as always, I'm very pleased to have regular panelist uh, Steve Chink, who is the Vice President for College Relations and Development at Federal College, and uh, we will ask uh, Steve Chink to come up with those questions. Thank you, Tony. Um, in a blinding flash of inspiration, I thought, well, we, maybe we should begin at the beginning here. And I, and I thought I would ask each of you uh, to comment a bit about, um, from a historical perspective, how long has the search for some meaning in life, uh, some connection with, uh, with spirituality, some belief uh, in a greater being, how long has that been with us as human beings? Well, I would say since human beings have, have begun. Um, we talk about, you look at mythology, you look at where people are always looking for a quest, something beyond themselves to explain you know, why, why the sun goes down. Is it going to come back the next day and, and those kinds of things. So I would think from the beginning. Bob? I recall in, in seminary that uh, in ethics class, I thought they were going to have us start off by looking at um, maybe St. Paul or Moses. Uh, we started with Plato and work backward and then forward uh, so that in, in uh, academic uh, religious training, um, in a good school, you go far afield and, and you go way back uh, to the point that students feel like, uh, how far back can we go? And that is really the question is, how far back can we go? And I think uh, Jung raised that question. Well, let me, let me ask you to be maybe a bit uh, philosophical. What does that tell us then, um, uh, seeing that, that human beings have always searched for uh, the truth about their origins, the meaning of their life? What does that tell us about a, a basic human need for, uh, for um, a, a, some foundational belief system and, and some understanding of who they are and why they're here? Well, I would just kind of off the cuff, think that there's that sense of there's something more um, longing for or needing to identify with something or someone beyond oneself, that knowing that I don't know all there is to know, um, and hoping maybe, wanting, needing to believe, that know that there's something beyond, something that knows more than I do, that, that has an understanding of how this is all put together, why it's all put together. Sometimes I think that, that it's the it's psychology of religion helps to understand that people don't like being alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, was it Marx or Lenin that said, uh, if, if there were to God, we'd create one. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, humanity does not like a sense of being alone. And, and the lowest denominator is an individual does not like being alone. Uh, so there's a yearning uh, to find a meaning outside of ourselves. 
and then in any religion you find that they come to say but then it's a relationship with that with it, which is outside of yourself that you're really searching for and the question then comes as we've had in a Lenten program one year uh, how do you establish that relationship how do you reach out and connect uh, of course these days there's a kind of a, a lot of interest in how do you make uh, a meaningful connection with another human being. Mm -hmm. If Tony will allow me one more question. Um, in, in your own ministries, in, in, among your own congregations, uh, do, do you frequently have people who come to you uh, who perhaps have never had a strong religious belief or maybe did it one time and suddenly say, I need to get back into the church? Uh, and if so, does that happen at somewhat predictable times in their lives or is it associated with any events that you see? That, any patterns there at all? Right. I, I mean, some things that I would often see is when people get married and start mm -hmm. raising a family, uh, oftentimes they want to do something for the children. Um, <clears throat> and so they begin there. Also, I think at some kind of crisis times, I work a lot with, I've done a lot with women um, and some of those different patterns and milestones in their lives when they begin to, to look at who they are and their lives have changed or they are changing. So there's some of that but I've also had a lot of people in the church who have been in the church for years and years and years and, and then begin to say, I want to know more about why I'm here mm -hmm. <laughs> and what that's about. So those are some of the particular ones I can I think we're, we're coming out the other end of a, of a period of time that was known for a spiritual renewal in the church and in the churches. And um, during that time, the 70s and 80s, uh, there were a lot of spiritual renewal programs, Crucial movement, uh, retreat movements, upper room movements, uh, all of them weekend retreats to, to deepen your spiritual life for church members and to develop uh, the spiritual lives of especially uh, prominent lay leadership in the church. But now um, I think that what I've heard just said is that, that they're coming from the pews and, and, and asking the pastors, um, there's got to be more to, to my spiritual life than the ritual we're using. Uh, what is this all about, really? How can I grow? At times of year, even help. Uh, it's the strangest thing you can predict. Lent is going to bring it out. Uh, and and, and it, it's synonymous with uh, festivals that are happening in Judaism and Islam. Uh, they find the same thing at this time of year, just before spring arrives, and as spring arrives, people have this yearning. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the crises in people's lives, uh, whether it's birth, marriage, uh, death, uh, they, want, they want answers. And they, the, what used to be offered as a pat answer is no longer acceptable. If I can add to sure. that, I think not only, and Bob was talking about in, in the 50s and 60s, but at least in my denomination, there's a renewed interest in this. And, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Methodists are kind of late in coming to spirituality sometimes. Um, and that understanding that even life as it's lived, you know, technology is going so fast. And what is there that can make some sense out of this for me? What is this that, that can hold, hold meaning to that in, when everything else seems to, before I know it, you know, my computer's out of date the minute I buy it, those, those kinds of things. I'm taking too much time, but I, I have to follow up and ask you, you said Methodists are kind of late in coming to spirituality. Could you define, I mean, we, some people might think that, that, that if you belong to a church and are a member of an organized religion that you are a spiritual person. How are you, mm -hmm. how are you using the term spirituality in oh, that context? Yeah, that's good, Steve. I would think uh, spirituality really talks about more deepening our relationship with God living uh, a constant and everyday kind of awareness of that. And I think, at least with Methodists, we come from John Wesley, who was very much into the social, social gospel and, and social justice. And, and though there was a real strong, firm grounding in the Anglican Church, um, that we began to work more on, on those issues, but then to began to also think about our own personal relationship with God, and then how that spreads out to not only our personal, but the community. So spirituality is talking a deeper understanding of a, of a prayer life, a meditation life. Does that Yes, it that? does. Thank you. All of what you said is just so very, very interesting. And Steve's done a wonderful job taking us through some of the, the 
searches that are going on in our topic is the search for the meaning to life. Let's just take a moment to zero in on the, the key word here that we're dealing with, and that is religion. How would you define religion in the context historically of today, and also contrast that with uh, those who seek uh, philosophical answers to questions but are not religious? The difference between mm -hmm. philosophy and religion. Hmm. Well, they're both dealing with systems of thought okay. and how you express uh, your system. Um, I have had an extensive experience in leading a spiritual recovery workshop for uh, chemically addicted people who are in recovery. And uh, the first question I ask is if uh, you were going to suggest to somebody uh, how to get in touch with God, what would you suggest? The second question is, what's the difference between religion and spirituality? Mm -hmm. And just go around the room and around the circle and have them define for themselves. And it's, it, it always comes down to saying, well, religion is a bunch of rules and regulations and guidelines and restrictions. And I said, according to the Latin, you're right. <laughs> and spirituality is a much more freeing thing. However, we have these directives in religion that are pointing us toward uh, a relationship with um, a power greater than ourselves, a, sp uh, a, a spirit greater than our own, is different from ours. Uh, philosophy is, is, is going to be to come to the same thing, to a meaning in life, by an intellectual approach. And uh, they're not incongruous. There's the philosophy of religion, and there's the religion of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Reverend Bowles, what would you add to that? And, uh, the, and then in particular, the definition of, of religion and, and that relationship to spirituality. There's not a lot I would, I would uh, change or certainly differ from, from Bob, certainly in religion being the this, this system. And, and um, I, think, <clears throat> I think the religion and spirituality, if I would have to put those two, what, what is different about those? Um, I like to talk. Bob, Bob talked about the freedom and, and the kind of the risk taking in, in spirituality that we get involved with. And, and uh, religion does have parameters that we, that we think we cannot go beyond um, because I think people's spirituality goes far beyond their, their religion. A follow up to you, Reverend uh, Bowers, <clears throat> that has to do with you both have had so much experience, and I, I'm thinking of the different uh, members of your congregation that's bringing you these uh, really remarkably challenging questions. Mm -hmm. And we hear a lot in religion about, uh, from theological texts, you know, how much is clear evidence and how much is taken upon faith. Mm -hmm. and so my question is a evidence faith question, and mm -hmm. how would how do you address <coughs> that? I mean, uh, let me let me give a footnote to this. One of the things I've heard from your conversation is that, in, in fearing to be alone, I would assume one takes that the next step in saying that uh, for us, death is a mystery that we've not been through yet, unless for those who believe in reincarnation, and that's a small percentage in this country. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, the unknown, it, it, there's anxiety in the unknown and so forth. So part of that is, do you uh, advocate that uh, a certain amount's on faith, or is there evidence, you know, the fear of being alone at death or, or, mm -hmm. or what comes after death, is that a, a real important component within uh, the pursuit of religion and its meaning? I'm sure that it is. I'm sure that people are longing to know that this is not all there is. But it becomes more than that. I think um, there becomes that Paul Tillich talks about that leap of faith, that time that you have to leave your, your, your rationality behind and, and either believe or not believe. And I think, in terms of in terms of death, that's an interesting question, Tony. Um, I've not really thought about it in terms of that. Um, I, have time to, I know I don't have sure, a lot of time sure. to think. Right? But uh, uh, let me put it another way, and then we'll get Reverend Hazard to come up too. I've had the fortunate uh, pleasure of meeting a number of what we call theologians that mm -hmm. are highly trained, and others that are religious activists but not uh, theologians, and. I hear two views. One is that uh, as you read from particularly the field of different religions and, and their, their Bibles, that they point that there's evidence from those scriptures of the existence of the mm -hmm. Supreme Being. And then others that are from somewhat different uh, perspectives have much more emphasis on faith 
rather than mm. saying you have to take it on faith, rather than trying to prove everything with specific evidence or, or from the prophets. Mm -hmm. and things. Uh, and how do you address that with your congregation? Well, I kind of think about my own self. I went through that time where I had to okay. prove that the Red Sea was probably the Reed Sea, and there were times when sandstorms would come up, so Paul would be, you know, Saul would be blinded and become Paul. And there was that time when I, I had to go through that, I felt, for myself to understand that. And then there came a time when, um, <clears throat> yes, that was fine, but there was more to it. There was, there was more a sense of, of, I trust, I believe, and I go beyond that. Um, I could probably, evidentially, probably prove that there, you know, there wasn't a God uh, if we needed to go in that path. I mean, I think there's rational thought for that. Um, but I think that, that faith is where it comes down for for me. Um, take that, take that step, and, and then you see those things after the fact. Reverend, has, mm -hmm. uh, Father Hazard, that is is that a common uh, understanding of most religions that there's a lot of it that has to be based on faith. Oh, even outside of religion, we do a lot of things in life. Faith. You walk across the street and you uh, you assume that that car is going to stop at the red light, and you take mm -hmm. faith to go out there. That, without total evidence that they will stop. Yeah, I nearly got hit that way this afternoon. <laughs> um, and, and that's probably illustrative of, of what I think Christian existentialism really means by faith. Um, in Greek, the word is a gerund, faithing. And uh, to, to go to that root of the meaning of the word is to say then uh, faith is a relationship. It's not a belief system or an acceptance of any teaching at all. It, it's, it's an active encounter of God, and so we're back to spirituality. Uh, without an encounter of God, uh, we can't accept uh, anything that religion has to say. And so I think it's, it's, it's the, the concern and interest in spirituality these days um, focuses on, on human experience and the human encounter of God, which can be communal or it can be individual. Uh, we find uh, people holding hands and saying the Lord's Prayer at an AA meeting and, and, and confiding in one another as I felt the presence of God during that prayer. And you have 40 other people saying I felt the hands of the people on either side of me. Um, so it is, a, it is an individualized thing, this thing we call faith if I understand Christian existentialism, which I kind of accept. Okay, that, that really leads me to another question, then I'll go back to Steve, I have one more question. Um, when you talk to people from different uh, organized religions and, and look at their faith and their dogma and their principles, not only does that have some differences, but also if you talk to individuals, somehow very, uh, they testify or witnesses to some very, very deep personal experiences that they say, that convince them that there's no question that there, there, that there is a God. And they also, a number of them believe that they have uh, guardian angels and they've had the experience of that. Whereas other people who are very religious say, no, it doesn't come that way and I've not had any, any real personal experiences, but I have the doctrine, I have the faith. Uh, we'll start with you, Reverend Bowers. Uh, how do we explain this, and Reverend uh, Father Hazard has just alluded to this too, do people have different experiences, or how do you explain this great differences in testimonies about their experience with uh, religion? I would imagine, because <laughs> every one of us is individual, and we could have we could all explain the same thing that's happening here, but it would all be from a different perspective, from a different lens. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think that people need to be able to say, to be able to share those experiences. I think sometimes. People have had experiences they don't know who to share those with. Are you going to laugh at me? Are you going to, you know, denigrate my experience? Um, I, I certainly try not to. Um, I don't understand mm -hmm. some of these experiences, um, but I think that comes from that individual relationship with God that, that Bob has alluded to and talked about. And then when we share those um, communally, there's a lot of uh, commonalities. Maybe that's why what puts us in denominations and what mm -hmm. puts us in these kinds of faith experiences. I think it's just simply the the willingness to share them, you know, and not to um, use any kind of demeaning manner to another person who's had those experiences. Father okay. Hazard, I, I think that um, I'll never forget the first time this came up. Without going into the details, was someone a group was saying many are called and few are chosen, 
and uh, we are those who have been chosen because we've had these experiences. Mm -hmm. What do you say about that, Father Hatzarin? And I said, well, I don't know. I'll have to go think about this. And so I went and got my Bible commentaries out. And that's a statement of, in the Gospel according to Matthew only, and it's a reflection on Matthew's experience of God, his experience of Jesus, that, um, that he had to be hit between the eyes of the crude. Now, there are many of us who have had um, extraordinary uh, experiences of the presence of God. But I don't think we should be too flattered by that. It proves only one thing. Some of us are more stubborn than others, and, and God it favors us with uh, getting our attention. Other people just seem to grow naturally, gradually. It evolves in their life. They know the presence of God gradually, and one day the light just comes on and say, well, it's always been this way with me, and I just can't tell you when and how it started. I've just floated through life uh, feeling the presence, and I envy people like that. I am one of those hard-headed Matthew types <laughs> that has to, you know, get my attention, and then, sh then, I'll, then I'll pay attention. I appreciate your confession on the program. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Shee. Um, I know you didn't come here to, prepared to talk about uh, religions around the world, but I, and, I, and I do have a point to this line of questioning. Mm -hmm. I, I, how would you rate the health of organized religion today? Your own denominations, and, and, and I know it's so broad brush that it's, it's not even really a fair question, but in general terms, how do you think organized religions are faring? I think that, that um, it depends on which religion you look at, and within each religion, um, the denomination of it. You know, we're, we're aware that within the three major religions of the world, there are multiple denominations. And I think that the more you have the uh, Jewish, Christian, and and uh, Islam, and um, I think that the more the more dogmatic expressions of each of those is growing. Hmm. Um, those that demand a, a more intellectual approach uh, are remain not they're not diminishing; they're remaining kind of level. And so that if we're talking about membership, uh, health of religion uh, in terms of uh, membership, then we have to say the more dogmatic expressions are growing. And we've got research on that uh, by the sociologists. How, and how are you using the term dogmatic in this? Uh, uh, the not? very clear cut answer to your questions. Any question you ask, All right. here's the answer. It, 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 would that be different from, from a fundamentalist? Uh, um, well, fundamentalist is a term that gets bandied around too much. Um, there, there, there are different types of fundamentalism okay. or, and different types of literalism. But in general, the philosophical definition of fundamental is it, it deals with the basics. These are the basic teachings, and here's how you apply them to your daily life. But in, but in the definition you're using of dogmatic, it's no room for individual interpretation. That's this right. is all right. Reverend Bowers? My first comment on that in your first question was that, you know, I think we're all ailing. And yet, when I thought about that, I think maybe we're stronger. I think we are stronger than, than we think we are because I think there's a lot of conversation going on with those dogmatics, you know, within, within denominations, within, within religions. So that gives me hope because there's a lot of uh, interest in, um, in pursuing, you know, a, a, a truth. Uh, very uh, truth or, or such a thing. Um, so I, I think that organized religion probably is kind of losing its, its strength, but at the same time, I think maybe ailing but uh, uh, healing. Eventually, and we may have to wait till the next show, but eventually I want to get to some questions about the, 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 the role of the church um, in, in mm -hmm. faith for the individual, how important it is, what its, what its purpose is, etc. But, but um, to get back to talking about about religion and churches, um, what do you see happening today in terms of the proliferation of denominations? Um, certainly, we do see some of it in Christian faiths. So I don't know whether it goes on uh, in the other major religions or not. Any comments there? Uh, back up and, and if 
define what you mean by the proliferation. It, it, it would seem that, and, and, and of course I, I don't have a catalog in my mind right. of all of, of all of the the Christian groups. The church, there's so many churches being formed, and, and many of them oh, are yeah. churches I've never heard of before. Um, You're referring to independent of denomination. Yes. Or, or, or from a denomination. Yes. Or, uh, right. Of course, you know, <coughs> I, I'm certainly not a religious historian. Superintendents understand this better than parish yeah. <laughs> clergy. Yeah. The administrators. Yes. <laughs> but obviously, there over history that many new religious groups have have uh, denominations they have sure been have. formed, They've been yeah. springing up. Uh, a lot, and they grow. They, they 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 attract a large number, and I think you have to look at at the individual congregation to get a flavor of this. Some of them are uh, are uh, very large number, two three thousand members of the congregation, um, and very committed to community service and and mission overseas. Others are very ingrown, spending all the money they they collect off of these two three thousand people uh, for just parish programs, their own congregational programs. Uh, you have to take them separately. Of course, I obviously uh, have a prejudice, I, you know, we all do. Um, any congregation that lives to itself is going to die to itself. And you just and, it, and we've seen this happen. Those congregations that flourish and, and bud in a hurry, but have no eccentric concerns, uh, they die out within 15, 20 years or less. But those that are eccentric are just like any eccentric mainline denominational congregation. Uh, they're going to be around a long time because they're not just concerned with their own selves. Yeah, there is that sense of if it is a God, it will last. You know, and, and some of these will, will go for a time. But um, I think time will tell. And I think it's simply a sense of there's a lot of freedom. There's a lot of individual, you know, individuality in that. On that note, we have to bring the program conclusion. Steve, you've really built a bridge for us for next mm -hmm. week. And the good news is for our viewers that our two guests will be back again next week and discuss this uh, issue. And uh, we have some other questions in the area of religion that we would like to pursue at that time. Uh, I I'm thinking of one right now that we'll look at New Testament, Old Testament comparisons and questions. And I thank you for today's program. It's just the start, and it's been so fascinating. And we'll pick up again next week at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite you to be with us again next week, and we'll continue the discussion on religion, a search for the meaning to life. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station. by the lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. I am very pleased to welcome you back to our second week of our discussion of religion a search for the meaning to life. For any viewers who were not with us last week, we had a very stimulating discussion with two guests who are back today to continue this discussion, and we're very pleased to welcome them to our program. Uh, first of all is Father Bob Hazries, who is the pastor of St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, Father Hazries, welcome back. Uh, we were so interested in your comments last week, and we look forward to pursuing additional areas of religion this week. It's good to be back. Thank you. And our second guest is Reverend uh, Pastor Flora Bowers. She serves at this time as District Superintendent for Eastern Washington and North Idaho United Methodist Church. And uh, Pastor Bowers, it's great to have you back. And again, we just got started. I know we can't finish everything this week, but we look forward to searching uh, for this uh, question and its answer. Thanks, Tony.
welcome. And it's always I'm pleased to have regular panelist uh, Steve Schink, who's the Vice President of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College. And we shall ask Steve to start today's questioning. Thank you, Tony. We, uh, we didn't quite finish up um, um, last week with the discussion that we'd started about uh, the, sort of the, the relative health of, of uh, denominations and, and organized religions, um, your own and others around this country and around the world. And I thought I would, f would, would continue that at least briefly uh, and ask you um, what causes you the most concern um, w when you think about that, the health of those organizations, yours and others, and, and what gives you the most optimism? I think the thing that causes me the most concern is a sense of apathy that um, either people are too busy, they don't want to think, um, and it doesn't seem to be that important to them. That's, that's a, a real deep concern of mine. Um, and what gives me the most hope, what gives me the most hope is that when issues arise, there is a lot of, of strength. There are a lot of um, opinions that want to be heard. And I think that's hope. I think that's hope when people are energized. Um, if it is around an issue, then it maybe can move beyond beyond the issue. And so that's a hopeful sign for me. Well, I, think, I think that um, an answer is to say the same, uh, the same thing bothers me either way. You know, it's, it's a it's a mixed blessing um, to discover the, uh, the uh, total ministry movement that's happening in, uh, in our denomination, I think most denominational religions, um, that there's a total ministry of clergy and laity together. The sorting of that out is, um, is, is a very hard, hard thing to do, and it can be disruptive, uh, but there's there's a commitment to it that we can't turn back from now. It's going on and it's going to continue. Whether we call that a rediscovery of the first century or something new in the 20th century doesn't matter. But as people work out with their clergy and staff uh, how to do ministry better together, uh, it's going to be a mixed blessing. That, that might just be the perfect transition uh, into uh, my next line of questions. And I promised last week there was a there was a point to my questions about the health of, of, um, of uh, organized religions. And what I really wanted to get to then, and this gives me that opportunity, is, is this question, general question to you. We, we talked early in, in the last show about spirituality and, and about uh, individual relationships with God. As people become more spiritual and as they become more, more um, as they develop more of a personal relationship with God, what, what becomes the appropriate role for the church? What does, the, what does the church bring to faith and to spirituality for the individual believer? I, I think what happens is the individual believer brings things back into the church and says mm -hmm. to the church, you know, we need, I need, we need to change. We need to be more um, responsive to, to the world around us. We need to be more responsive to how faith fits into the workplace. Of how I can live out my spirituality, and and I think if people will, and I think many people will come back and, and demand of the church <laughs> that that the church um, responds. I think the traditional saying is the gospel doesn't change, but the way it's presented changes, and and I think um, for a church um, to survive and for a denomination to survive, it becomes uh, more attentive to where the people are. Um, not giving people just you know what they need, or, you know, but simply what they want together with what they need and, and then growing. I find that um, people are on that same vein, uh, searching for the Monday connection. In fact, there's a book by that title. Mm. Um, and the church's responsibility, I think, is it spiritually, is to help people identify their spiritual gifts. What particular gifts do they have to carry back? to address the issues. Instead of just asking us, what's the solution to this? We should be then working with people and saying, all right, let's, let's do an evaluation. Let's find out what your, what your special gifts are. And then uh, let's see you get out there and use those to address that very issue you brought to our attention. It, may I, Tony, one more? Um, the, the title of our, 
of our two shows is religion and the search for meaning in life. And I think you've, you've already partly answered the question I'm about to ask, mm -hmm. but, but why do I, why does anyone in the audience, why do we need the church uh, to help us answer that question? Uh, and I may be broadening this too much, mm -hmm. but um, we talked again earlier in the last show about the difference between religion as a set of guidelines and faith as a, mm -hmm. as a relationship with God. How, how do those two things play out in terms of the, the, the church? One of the, I think, just one thing I'd say, and then we could pick up on something else, yeah. is that uh, you, we've all been aware in education of stages of, of uh, uh, development. Well, in religion, we're becoming aware of stages of spiritual development. And a, a lot of pioneering work has been gone on in the last 30 years on this. It's mature now, and this is something where those, not all church leaders, but those church leaders who are acquainted with the stages of spiritual development can help people uh, become more comfortable with their place in the world. I think, um, for me, the church is a, a gathering place uh, where people can come to ask these questions. And if the church truly is being what it is intended to be, I think the body of Christ, where people can gather and grow. This simply gives them a focal point and a place to come and meet others who are asking that same question. And so I think the church becomes that place and, and enlarges itself and, and grows and, and then says to people, this is a safe place, this is a good place, this is a healthy place mm -hmm. where, where your questions are invited and listened and responded to. Not, not, no, you don't ask questions here, but come because we're all searching, looking together. Thank you. If one does a, a search of uh, the doctrine of different organized religions, and Reverend Hazard, you've identified three major religions in the world, but even within one of those major religions, there will be different denominations with different approaches. And so as you have your dialogue and uh, with people from different parts of the world and religions, one discovers that uh, one particular religion will say, this is the only path and you must follow this path for the acceptance uh, of God and your journey into heaven. Another religion will take a different path and says you must follow this path to get there. And so my involved question, and you and I have discussed this once before, uh, some, long, uh, some time ago, in dialogue I've had with some individuals, I have suggested to them, is it not possible to have total commitment to your path and your belief, but to celebrate and respect another path by someone else. And so the response to me is, no, you can't do that because that's not being true to your path. You cannot compromise it. That the fact that you celebrate and recognize another one that you don't agree with uh, somehow might hinder you from getting to heaven. So how do you both respond to this real uh, division that one finds in uh, some individuals in their precepts of religion? Human nature is a very competitive spirit. At least this human being does. And um, I don't think it's that different that we like to think that what we believe and the way we are is the right way. Um, but to my understanding of, of the world religions, they all ask for mutual respect. Uh, it, if we can just keep that clear uh, in our dialogue, then ecumenism really is the most exciting uh, communication you can have. And that means a dialogue between myself as a Christian and someone who is, does not consider themselves a Christian. That's true of humanism. Uh, for a Methodist and Episcopalian to have a discussion is like having tea and crumpets. <laughs> well, I, and I would agree with you, Bob, that someone once said, talking in tongues, really a good definition of talking in tongues is having these people from different uh, different faith stances come together and actually begin, come sit down and have the tea and crumpet together. Uh, it may be a real simplistic uh, explanation, but one, one piece that I've always liked is you know, your hand. You have five, you know, how many, four fingers and a thumb <laughs> come together to form that hand, and yet they're all coming together to work, to work together. Um, I have personally, uh, Bob too, the idea of just sitting down and being together. I often think if I was born in Japan and was a Shintoist, 
I might be a very good Shintoist, you know, <clears throat> but I like to think I'm trying to be a, a good Christian because that's the path that has been that I've chosen and that, that's been set that I've been set for. So I hear you both saying that you can be true to your path mm -hmm. and your belief, and yet have this great appreciation for someone else's path, but it doesn't hinder your path to celebrate and recognize and accept the right of others to seek a different well, path. Well, perhaps borrow some techniques from each other mm -hmm. too. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, that would make God very happy. <laughs> you know, that the, there's a sense of uh, God smiling when when that that happens. I think just um, I one more question on this line, and that is that for a study of God and and uh, particularly the Christian faith and uh, looking at the Old Testament, New Testament, and so forth, and and other religions, other main religions of the world, uh, one doesn't find in those statements or doctrines of God that uh, God favors a particular uh, religion, a particular denomination within a particular religion. That's, um, St. Peter had a hard time with that in the Christian religion um, and had to have a, God disrupt his life to let him know that God has no favorites. Um, and then Paul himself came along with the same same issue. And it was Paul who theologized it, saying uh, that in, in Christ there is neither male nor female, Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, that all are equal in Christ. And I believe that the other two ma major religions, Jewish and Islam, in their own way are trying to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. I have another line of questions, and I'll do that, and then Steve will have hopefully a lot of time left to pursue this with, with the two panelists, it makes it easier for us to spend a little more time. Uh, I want to talk from the perspective of the Christian faith, and I will just choose the uh, King James Version of the Bible, and, and we'll take a look at the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I know, uh, Reverend Bowers, that this is some of the things that you're doing in the United Methodist Church. You're, you're sitting down and talking about mm -hmm. the, some new developments and new issues, well, they're not new issues, but they're uh, coming to the front in your church, and I commend you for having those dialogues, but I guess what I want to talk about is something called selective acceptance of certain passages and ignoring others, but using <laughs> certain passages to... It's called proof texting. Proof texting, yes, okay. exactly. Thank you. I, I'm we not, like to do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you brought the terminology to mind. Let's take the Old Testament, for example, and I'll start with you, um, Pastor Bowers, and that is, as you look through uh, the mandates and the requirements, there are a number of things that are listed there that if one uses a totally literal interpretation that we are not to do, that we do do, and, and mm -hmm. doesn't seem that people in the Christian faith uh, and the Luke leaders uh, ever condemn that. And there are other, uh, other passages where it is condemning and then the doctrine is that it's wrong and sin. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can go through some of these examples if you want to, but why don't you react to that and how do we, how do we cope with that in modern times? Okay, you want me to react to it and say seated? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. You might be lost on camera if you got up. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, I, I think I react to it by trying to be calm <laughs> and trying to say, you need to look at the total picture. picture. You know, you look at the context in which it was written, why it was written, uh, what it hoped to accomplish. And, and in my most cynical moments, when people will list up something, I have... I have worked on this very hard, so I will list up something else <laughs> that so seems like, to it's, be... It's point and counterpoint. Right, and, and I realize yeah. that's really non-productive. Um, but if I have to do it, I, I could. Yeah. Um, and so I simply say, okay, but let's look at all of this together. And what is the overall message? Of, say, we're talking about the Hebrew Scripture, so right. what's the overall message of that? Where is the grace in that? Where is the love in that? Where is, where is the mercy? Where is the compassion? And then try and, and, and look at these passages if people want to do that and say, well, because I've studied this a lot, I've preached on this a lot, and, uh, and I think I'm able to do that. And the hardest thing for me is to be calm and to be tolerant <laughs> and, to be, and to be loving. Well, thank you so much. Okay. The, the rabbis say that um, the central theme of the entire Hebrew scripture is hospitality at all costs, including the jeopardy of your own soul. Um, and so that regardless of my own behavior or that of someone else, 
Hospitality must be practiced between the two people or two groups. And that's the way I try to neutralize that kind of discussion. Let me take that just one step further, because Reverend Bowers, uh, Pastor Bowers, uh, would have made me think of this. If, if someone is being very insistent with being in the church, <laughs> and they take a passage and they say, the Bible says this, and therefore we can never give in, and then we can never be maybe inclusive, then is it almost essential for the dialogue within the church for you to bring up a, another example of a mandate to at least get their attention to say, uh, well, then if you're going to be insistent here, you've got to do this where they can't. No, at least does that not create a, a greater dialogue and understanding? I think so. I think oftentimes it does, because people will they'll they'll stop. They have to think. They have to look. They have to listen. Um, it's it's difficult because as you know, Tony, we in the Methodist Church, we aren't different from from other denominations. Are really working at dialoguing and trying to to work on um, any issues within our church. And what has been happening, and I'm really excited about this, is that people who really are at these divergent points and really will proof text and pull out pull out pieces of scripture, have actually come away from we have four and five hour workshops simply saying I didn't realize we could talk to each other. That's been an exciting piece for me. We haven't made any resolves, but we can talk and be at table together. Um, this is this is exciting news for people who don't think on, on either side who don't think we can do that. I have to bring Father Hazard here on this. In fact, that your own church is having some dialogue mm -hmm. too and debates over some issues too. Oh, maybe. And, and <laughs> dealing with the same question about you know how do we bring all this together? And, and do, do you too have this need at times to? to bring up counter? Um, uh, yes and no. Um, my way of dealing with that is to say that the church is not a church of a book, Old or New Testament. It's, it's, it's a church that it belongs to God. And uh, God has been involved with a um, religious community for centuries, uh, more centuries than we care to admit and has found that uh, he's not given up. And so I, I really reverse it instead. I just make it totally personal and say, you know, before we go ahead and discuss who's in and who's out, um, I'm going to act to ask you, and I'll answer the same question if you like, uh, how, much, uh, how much has God had to put up with out of me or you? And if God can put up with me and you, he can put up with anybody. I, I am, um, I think, going to expand on this conversation we've been having for the last few minutes. But I, I, I wanted to give you a little bit of a warning of, of a question that will come so you can think about it when, when the other person is talking. At some point, I hope, before we, we end um, uh, today's show, I, I would ask you to share with us, if this isn't too unfair, if you had a minute uh, uh, this next Sunday to, to um, deliver a, a one-minute sermon to your congregation about uh, religion and the search for meaning in life. I, I'd, I'd love to give each of you a minute just to just to expound on that topic without anything further from us in the way of prompting for questions. But to get back to, to this other discussion, um, St. Peter, God has no favorites. Could could and maybe one wants to take the the, the um, here are the similarities. One wants one of you wants to take the differences. Mm -hmm. The three major religious groups we've been talking about. Um, what are in your view one of you? The, the major similarities between those three, and what are the, the major differences? Between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Actually, it, it, in some people would say that it's, a, it's a stepping blocks, that uh, uh, a foundation that was laid by Judaism was built upon by Christianity, which in turn was built upon by Islam. Um, if you simply look at the uh, increased number of commandments or laws, uh, the increased number of rituals that are uh, that come all about, uh, you can see that they're all interrelated, and yet uh, each is going to point to uh, a different aspect of it. One uh, Judaism is going to point to uh, the law itself as as the way to uh, be come into the presence of God. Um, Psalm 119, over 
and over and over and over for page after page says, the study of the law makes me aware of how much you are involved in my life, O Lord. Uh, where with Christianity, we have a, we, we have a, a person that we have a relationship with uh, by meeting other people who had a relationship with that same person, uh, namely Jesus. And then we come to Islam that says, look, here, here are interpretations of the law and interpretations of a relationship with the major prophet. Um, all of them are pointing to a spirituality, actually, a power outside of themselves that uh, they're expected to come into contact with. That's the way I would put it. I, I would agree with Bob. It's real hard to look at the differences when I try so much. But I think most of us, a lot of us, try to focus on what is central. A, a few years ago, I remember within the same week, uh, Ramadan, Passover, and Easter occurred. Mm -hmm. And the, I was doing a radio spot when I was in Seattle. And again, focusing again in that God who, who loves, God who desires a relationship with us, and then desires us to, to live out that relationship um, in love with people and, and bringing all that together and, and changing and making life a good, uh, positive uh, place to be and to live. Um, and so I just, it's really hard for me to want to focus on the differences. I think we often do that too much, Steve. Mm -hmm. And if we, can, if we can find the things that, that, that bring us together, um, I think that's a, that's a productive. So it may be a cop out to just well, answer that well. Well, and if, if I may, <coughs> um, how, how do the other two major religions deal with the question of, of forgiveness and redemption that's so central to Christianity? How do, is there anything comparable in, in those faiths? Certainly in Judaism, uh, the Day of Atonement. And in Christianity, the celebration of Holy Week. Um, Islam, I've got to beg some ignorance. I think maybe you told it how festival of Ramadan. Yeah, Ramadan. In, in, right. in there, and um, and focusing on that that time of, of remembering, mm -hmm. uh, and then what goes beyond there. So there is a, a sense of we're all feeling a need for confession and a need for something better. Um, to call us to accountability. Lent, today is Ash Wednesday, and so in the Christian <laughs> faith, you know, we're focusing on, on, on what is that, that, that we need to just focus on our relationships and sense of, of um, beyond, beyond ourselves. I, I, again, I have to plead ignorance, too, on the, the touch on this one. Tony, do we have time or two for a word from each about? I think that we should have that uh, invitation she gave them if they're going to speak to their <laughs> congregation. And that's that's uh, to, that's not uh, I mean, obviously you don't have the time to put together a true sermon as you would if you were in your offices. But if you were trying to capture uh, in a few words what you think the essence of that religion, the search for meaning of life, is, and communicate it to a, a group or a congregation, what would you say to them? You want to go first? <laughs> okay, you, want me to? you can think. You have you thought? No, I I I. I had to do this before, so oh, I'd go be glad to go first. Um, reminds me of my seminary days. <laughs> yeah. the, um, if we want to take what we have in our practice of religion and make it relevant to our daily lives, then we need to chart our, our spiritual pilgrimage. And we need to do that and then find somebody that we trust to share that with. Because if we keep it to ourselves, we're not going to challenge it. We're not asking our friend to challenge it. We're asking our friend to listen to it and help us try to understand our, our spiritual pilgrimage. That at various times in our life, we've had significant events that were important to us, maybe no one else. And during that event, there, who, what, when, where, how did that happen? And at what level can we say that we sense the presence of God participating in it? To share events of that sort with a friend that simply helps us try to understand. Thank you. If I could send um, people away with one message, and that would be that the God is a God of love, a God of openness, a God of safety, a God of welcoming. Not that that's easy. It's not easy at all. And there are some things that uh, we can come to God with, and, and God will hear and know all and, and open, open, be open to all. 
and will walk that journey, that journey with us to uh, to to healing, to wholeness, um, and uh, to completeness. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. You really have zeroed on our topic, and what a nice, nice way to cl close this two-week series by having you to do that. I I think it just completes the circle in a very, very helpful, meaningful way, and you're very, very much to be commended for doing that. I do want to say to Flora Bowers and to Bob Hasley, thank you for this two-week series. It has been so informative. It's been stimulating. And I know Steve joins me in saying thank, thank you, much. Uh, how much we've enjoyed the program. Uh, and we hope to have you back sometime in the future. And good luck to both of you in the work that you do with your people. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been, as I said, uh, a very informative and pleasure for us to bring you this series. And we're going to move, as we always do on this program, to another issue. And one of the great joys that I have in this program is that we cover so many subjects uh, within a year. Uh, and this is the 27th year in which we've had this opportunity to do this. I would like to invite you to be with us again next week when we'll move to a, a very different subject. And, and hopefully that we give you uh, food for thought. And certainly your input to us is very valuable. And from that, we learn a lot. And we also get uh, some television programs uh, on subjects that you're interested in. We always like to hear from you here at North Idaho College. Uh, and uh, then I would like to say to you, until next week, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Instructional Technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station. <laughs>